I think it's important for two reasons. One, to hear what senior Chinese officials, senior regional officials, uh, business people from throughout the Asian region think about global issues, think about relations with the U.S. And second, to explain very clearly the United States has a very strong commitment to play a very strong leadership role in Asia uh, on political and economic and, and other matters, and that we are actively engaged in developments in Asia. We aim to continue to be. The President is quite interested in this. Secretary Clinton is. And we want to play a constructive role in the region and a very proactive one. President Obama will be visiting Indonesia, coming to Southeast Asia, in June. Is the United States prepared to re-energize its relations and engage with Southeast Asia after years of neglect by the Bush administration? We're definitely uh, prepared to re-energize our relations with this entire region. Uh, the visit to Indonesia is certainly part of that. We want to have a highly energized, very proactive uh, set of relations with Asia, not just because it's the fastest growing area of the world, which it certainly is, but also because there are a number of important geopolitical issues that have to be addressed. Uh, East Asia is more important in global finance than ever before. There's a lot of technological collaboration between Asian and American companies. We have a lot of our economic interests are in Asia. A lot of Asians are living in the United States. The Asian diaspora is a very dynamic part of the American economy. All those things contribute to our desire to have a more proactive relationship with Asia. Now, if we look at the dynamics of the global economy, you've got ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, 10 member nations in Southeast Asia with 575 million people and an average growth rate of 5.5%, plus China, Japan, and Korea, the ASEAN plus three. That dynamic block, how would you characterize relations between the U.S. and the ASEAN plus three region? Well, obviously, the Asians have uh, every reason to want to have more collaboration uh, among countries of the region. We welcome those types of collaborations and those uh, consultations that they have. But we also want to be sure that we are a major part of the new architecture that is emerging in the region. Um, we do not think it's healthy for Asia to develop an architecture which is exclusive of or shuts out relations uh, with the United States. We think that we have a very active economic role, financial role, security role in the region. And while we encourage Asians to talk to one another, work with one another, we also want to ensure that as they do that, in parallel with that effort, there's a lot more engagement between the United States and um, and, and ASEAN and many of these other institutions. We want to work with the Chinese, we want to work with the Koreans, we want to work with the Japanese. We value the, uh, the President's summit with uh, ASEAN and we want to continue those types of traditions. My last question concerns the risk of the United States being marginalized over time because of the rise of intra-Asian trade. Western Europe is flat and remaining anemic in economic growth terms. The United States will have a 2% growth rate perhaps, but still is losing market share and losing relevance as intra-Asian trade and investment flows and trade and capital flows between the Middle East and Asia replace traditional Western Asia ties. What are the risks for the United States in all of that? Well, certainly there is a lot more trade going on within the Asian region, as you say, also to, to the Middle East. Uh, that really is, I think, a, a function of, of the way growth has evolved in the region that there clearly is going to be, in part because of proximity in the region, in part because of higher rates of growth in the region. That is something that is part of the economic realities of our time. But by the same token, we also want to have a very thriving trade relationship with East Asia and with the Gulf states, and we don't see them as mutually exclusive. In fact, the more growth there is in East Asia, uh, the more opportunities American companies have to sell to the region, and American companies that invest in the region are also beneficiaries of, of that. Uh, so we don't see this as a zero-sum game. In fact, one of the key points I've been making out here is that the, the, the last thing we want to do, and the last thing Asia should want to do, is see competition 
between Asia and the United States, or China and the United States, or anyone else in the United States is a zero-sum uh, game. We, we think that in trade, just as the United States benefited enormously from Europe's recovery after World War II, which created big markets for American goods and opportunities for American companies, we see growth in, in Asia in, in much the same way. That's why, but, but the key is that it should be done as part of an open trading system with fair rules, fair opportunities, non-discrimination, a level playing field. That's the key. If, if that growth occurs in this context of a rules-based global system then and, and, and a level playing field, we can compete and they can compete and we can benefit from that competition. But the rules and the, the level playing field are a critical element from our point of view. And we're going to be working on things like this TPP negotiations and, and other kinds of things to ensure, and the Doha round to ensure that the rules are, are fair and there is a level playing, level playing field. That's our goal. That should be Asia's goal. They have an interest in a global trading system that works for everyone. So do we.